flatten ears to ground. Curve shoulder into the hollow of bones of earth beneath you. Hear stories travelling the roads of others, like the hum of a thousand tiny engines. Step over fence lines and valleys that hold more than water. Follow the fading shriek of siren, a sigh from another room, the conversation of birds. Do this before you leave, and our town falls away, shrinking into grid lines and patchwork paddocks, before the fingers of peninsulas and forking rivers fit inside the palm of your hand, before we are lost in the crumpled exhale, a tooth flung to the wind and the only question left is, did you have a good word? Before all of that. Go close to the nameless streets that lead to mouths full of untapped words, tuned to the hum of a thousand tiny engines. Good afternoon and welcome to One Hour With. I'm Reagan. How are you doing today? We are spending one hour with Andrew Matters. So Andrew uh, used to be in Neptune Lolly Shop. We were doing all right in the Adelaide and interstate scene back in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, he's currently in a band called the William Street Strikers, has been for a few years now, putting out some really good stuff. They're releasing an album in January. Andrew's come on the show to share three people that he'd love to spend an hour with, the songs that represent present them and later on we'll be talking more about the upcoming album. So without any further ado, such a cool thing to have you on the show today, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you and it's great to be here. I think the last time I was here was 30 years ago. Stop it. I know. You're going to bring that up again. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it but you know. (laughs) So on that note, let's kick off the show with a blast from the past. This is Neptune Lolly Shop Club Friendships. Reagan and today we're spending one hour with Andrew Matters of William Street Strikers. 
So, Andrew, we're obviously both music fans yep. from way back. It's yep. how we met. It's yep. why you're here. And I would love to know a little bit about your early influences. I guess one of my first influences uh, would be Billie Holiday. Now, um, that's mainly because uh, my grandmother and grandfather worked in big bands and that's what they did for a living, you know, when the RSLs were sort of really, really How working. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I got to see a lot of big bands when I grew up. And Billie Holiday, um, I think the first time I heard her singing, it was just something in her voice. I don't, I can't really describe it, but it's similar to Frank Sinatra. It's not a technically perfect voice, but it has a high emotional quota. Yeah. So, you know, when she sings a song, you can really feel what she's singing. You know, it's almost like you're looking at her and she elicits emotion. Um, and I was to find out later on that, yeah, she only has one, one and a half octaves, which is a quite a small range. Men usually only have one and a half octaves. So she didn't have a lot of range, but she was still able to put across any song and just do it with such, yeah, uh, just such warmth and, yeah, just really tell the story. Mm. So I liked her for that reason. Um, also, as I got older, when um, I started learning about her struggles and it comes down to sort of like governments like repressing artists because they mm. see them as dangerous and the fact that she was hounded down by, you know, the FBI, like Lenny Bruce and, and a lot of those people until she died at, I think she was only about 42 wow. with about 70 cents in the bank. Mm. Um, so she was, yeah, basically, yeah, hounded down to her death. So And that strikes a chord, you relate to it? I, I do, absolutely, mm. absolutely, because I think – Anybody who, well, let's say most people who have something to say have demons and and I think in the music industry, I mean, you're going to be exposed to drugs. That's just one of the things and I don't think there'd be a musician alive that wouldn't have come across that type of thing. So, yeah, that, that type of discrimination and... Um, criminalization of what really is a disease I suppose that made me relate to a more as an adult just through probably just my own getting my own fingers burnt a little bit along those lines um and yeah I just um in the end I guess it also just comes back to yeah just that one flower in the hair that simple voice and just yeah the way she sang yeah yeah so what song best represents Billie Holiday for you? Strange Fruit, I think. There are lots of other songs you could choose from, but that was the gutsiest song to do at the time, you know, with all of the Jim Crow laws that were happening in the States at that particular time. To put out a song with such, you know, um, graphic lyrics and to know that it could quite possibly wreck your career, which it did, and that's what got everybody against her in the establishment I just think was such a brave move but the fact also is she grew up watching the bulging eyes and people hanging over sycamore trees and all of that stuff and so yeah I just think it's probably one of the bravest moves by somebody who had everything to lose and nothing to gain she stood up from her point of privilege and put everything on the line so that's that's why I've chose that song um, bulging eyes and people hanging over sycamore trees. It basically describes you know, somebody hanging and how the you know the eyes would bulge and the blood would go down onto the flowers underneath the sycamore trees. That's powerful. It's very very powerful and I think it is yeah it is in the Library of America in um, whatever their cultural library's name is I can't recall it at the moment but yeah it's been recognised in 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 that league so yeah very important song of the twentieth century amazing influence um, so what has Billie Holiday taught you about being an artist I think what she has taught me as um, a singer is to not worry about perfection of uh of notes worry about the perfection of delivery and it really has affected the way I record because I can't say I've never used it but I hate auto-tune I would rather have something with a little bit more humanity a wavering baritone or something that might be a little bit pitchy than that sort of you know that 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 <laughs> Yeah, it sounds so obvious to me, maybe because I listen to it, but 
I still think, you know, humans want to hear some humanity coming out of music and I think that's why some music stands the test of time because it hasn't been micromanaged and mastered into such a state of perfection that it can often sound like um, elevator music. So I think that's what she taught me as a vocalist. So this is Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. And this afternoon, we're spending one hour with Andrew Matters from William Street Strikers. And up very soon, we'll play To the Motel by William Street Strikers. But first, Andrew, tell me more about the song and why you chose it. Okay, To the Motel, basically, I would say it's an amalgam of all of my experiences since I was probably 16 or 17 years of age of playing music. So, you know, you're going from one motel to to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And um, I think one of the lines in, 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 the, in the song is, checked into the motel but forgot its name. I could go and ask but they're all the same. Wake up in the morning wondering where I'm at. I look into the mirror and I say, who's that? And that just summarises a lot of my life. You know, cheap, seedy motels and playing songs and just living in that sort of... Um, weird world that nobody is supposed to live in but you do to get your art out there so that song really is just a song about yeah playing music i suppose it's got a little bit of um uh, bad relationship stuff in it because quite often if you're on the road you're having a bad relationship because the two don't work well together but yeah it's just a a narrative of just being in a band and the opening line in the song funnily enough 
phrases directly my favourite English poet being Shakespeare and it is uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. And that is if you're popping your head up and leading any sort of organisation, you are always going to have that sword of Democles that somebody's always trying to knock you off or undermine your authority or, you know, just basically um, make your life hard. But that's the price you pay for putting yourself up into that position and somebody's got to do it. So William Shakespeare, um, a bit of an influence for you, is he? Yeah, I mean, um, I suppose all of us, we studied him at school and all of that and I went to uni straight out of school like a lot of people did and I just, I suppose up until a certain point, I wasn't aware of just how many sayings are in the English language or how the English language would not be if he hadn't existed and also I just find all of his plays and all of everything he writes it relates to every commonality of human experience that we've all gone through whether it be a breakup uh, jealousy greed he has covered them all you know um and I think uh Brevity is a soul of wit, which is another one of him. That's what he's taught me as well, um, mm. that if you can say something in a short uh, way rather than a long way, it is much easily more easily digestible for your audience. The moment you, you never go broke appealing to the lowest common denominator. <laughs> That's the truth, isn't it? You know, it's just one of those truths. So, yeah, that's what I, I got from him. So, yeah, he's just one of those clever guys. Um, uh, and so some of the humour in that song in the lyrics uh, is like, um, when the phone doesn't ring, you'll know it's me. I just like those little slight bits of turns of phrase that you mightn't get straight away but will come back like a creeper and, and get you later on, which I think was a really good trick of his. Every time I read, say, The Twelfth Night or The Tempest or something, I'll be walking along and two or three days later a soliloquy will come into my head and I'll go, oh, wow, and I'll get something new out of it. And I think that's why he survived so long and is so lauded as one of our best writers. Amazing. Yeah. So if you got to spend an hour with William Shakespeare, what would you want to know? Oh, what I'd want to know is how does a person so young um, have so much, such a breadth of knowledge about the human condition? I mean, every year I, I, uh, that I grow older than he was when he died, I think, my God, he knew more about life at 30 than most people do by the time they're 80. And mm. I just... People like that, you wonder, are they are they born? Are they made? Is it a combination of nature and nurture? Just some people just have that mm, macro knowledge of life and the human psyche. And, yeah, I, I think that's what I'd, I'd, I'd want to know. And I imagine he could tell me really easily and he'd probably just say you look by looking. I don't know, but <laughs> it would be... I would be a fanboy if I was in front of him, so it would be it would be really hard. <laughs> but I'd give I would give it a go. So here we go. This is William Street Strikers to the motel. the 
mojo but forgot its name. I could go and ask but they're all the same. Wake up in the morning wondering where I'm at. Look into the mirror and I say who's that? Nature of the program view description is advised. For those of you left, let's step inside. Spent ten summers in a long sleeve shirt. Falling down a mound and a knee to dirt. Burning holes and nodding on the lounge. On the make and on the scrounge. Should have seen it coming as plain as day. Now I'm stuck in. This is One Hour With Andrew Matters from William Street Strikers, ex-Neptune Lolly Shop. Andrew has given us a couple of really amazing people to spend an hour with. We've had Billie Holiday and William Shakespeare and the third person. The third person I'd love to spend an hour with is Audrey Hepburn. And there's like a few reasons for that. Number one, I suppose, is the reason that everybody probably wants to spend or who likes actors would want to spend time with her is just she's just an incredible actress and her bell clear diction and just her mannerisms and the way she carries herself. I just... With all of that, the way that, you know, she just, everything about her, she it's just she carries herself with such a plomb. But she's also down to earth as well. The other thing is, I suppose, what a lot of people, they probably know, but it's not a lot, I mean, written about it, not as much as there should be, is her tireless charity work. Um, she's done so much work, or she did so much work when she was here, um, without fanfare, not looking to be on the cover of anything. She did it quietly behind the scenes. She donated to so many charities, and and I just, I don't know, that, that always gets me. The other thing is... <laughs> When I first saw her sing Moon River out on that stoop uh, with the nylon string acoustic guitar, I mean, yeah, that just gets my, um, it just fangs my shui. It just makes my, <laughs> it just makes my hair stand up on end, yeah. you know. And I think, again, it probably comes back to some nights I would walk around to my nan's place just to drop in for a cup of tea or whatever and I would hear the piano in the lounge room as I approached the front uh, door and it would be nan sitting there playing that song, mm. um, doing it in her more operatic sort of thing and so there's those memories associated with it and I suppose just the fourth thing, which is probably the least of it all, but she created a style that has been aped over Decades. I mean, Winona Ryder. I mean, you could go on. How would you describe that? You know, that that black, the 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 short little haircut, the black dress, and that certain eyeliner. That's just mm-hmm. it's just a look that permeates every era. Um, and I think that must be a hard thing to do because there's been a um, a lot of eras. And I mean, James Dean has that look: the white t shirt, the five oh ones, and a jacket. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Marilyn Monroe could be another one. There are all sorts of people that have um, 
a claim to rights of certain looks. But, yeah, hers is just one that's sort of timeless and classic. So, mm. yeah, she's a little black dress of modern acting, I suppose, if nice I may say that. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that one myself. So, yeah. So if you got to spend an hour with her, what would you want to know? What, what would, would I want to know? I, I suppose I would want to know how she learnt her chops because – now, the actor that she was in Breakfast at Tiffany's, I cannot think of his name and that is my terribleness. But the fact that she was coming in as a relative newcomer with these heavyweights of the acting world, how was she able to get in there and lift herself up to the point where she got co-billing on one of her first movies? I mean, was that? Was she born with that ability? Did she learn it? How was she able to incorporate that in it? Was it just the naivety of youth where you just think anything's possible? And I just don't know. I just, it's just like all of these prodigies. I just wonder how did they get their brilliance at such a young age where 95% of us get a little bit of it and have to work on it and build and, and and get better as we go along. Some people just come out and they're just bang on for their time. Mm. So I suppose there again it would be just trying to find out, yeah, just what made her into that um, that person that was so – that grabbed the attention on the screen and – has just made timeless movies that people are going to enjoy in 100 years. Mm. That's what I'd want to ask her. Mm. So this is Audrey Hepburn singing Moon River.
So that's about it for the show. We've spent one hour with Andrew Matters of William Street Strikers. Now, you've got an album coming out shortly. Yeah, we do. We've got our sixth album coming out and we think that will be out in January. And if anybody wants to have a look how the album is progressing, they can go to williamstreetstrikers.com where we'll have snippets about 30 or 40 seconds of each song so you can check out the progress as we go awesome what sort of music can we expect i would say it will be pretty much uh, akin to what we've always done which is basically just guitar inspired music with some harmonies and bits and pieces in there so all right so i gotta say i mean the last time we met in person yep You were in Neptune Lolly Shop and as talented as you were at that time, I can absolutely hear a difference now. Yes. A difference in maturity of lyrics, of playing, of of all the things. How can we see that manifest in what you're about to release, do you think? Well, I think exactly what you said is completely true. Um, Yeah, the last time we would have spoken, I probably... Well, number one, I was still a kid and um, I'd probably, even though I liked sort of like the Beatles when I was younger, I just got back into them. So I was more into the melodic pop type music. Um, Now, I suppose with life experiences and everything that happens during the course of your life, your ups and downs and your, your, your bigger understanding of life and becoming more proficient on instruments and being in the industry for so long, um, the music's probably changed along with myself. And yeah, it's probably is a little bit more, uh, I would say, sort of like West Coast sort of uh, rock and roll music with a bit of melody and, yeah, definitely better lyrics. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so as the William Street Strikers, you do seem to explore a fair variety of genres. Yes. Yeah. We do. Where's that come from? I think where that's come from, um, when I started this band, um, I wanted to be able to put out music that I wanted to put out. Um, now, having... Um, gone to a music school and sat in jam rooms for so many years. You know, I've picked up drums just like every other muso, guitars, mandolins, violins, all of that sort of stuff and learnt how to play most of them. And, you know, as you get older, your taste in music becomes so eclectic. Well, mine has. And I like anything from the 20s up until now. So with this band, it was just like put out anything that we like and hope that other people like it so I think we've been called genre unspecific but also having the freedom to do that it's not like um there's anybody sitting over my shoulder from a label or any of that sort of stuff with this band we can do what we want and sort of just have and luckily there's enough people on this little blue ball that have have liked it so yeah I'm really enjoying music at this stage Yeah, I can really tell. It's really awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. You're welcome. Anytime. Thanks for joining me for the show today. And if you'd like to spend more time with Andrew Matters, head to williamstreetstrikers.com. Next week, we have a local literary pleasure. Laura Croach, who was the um, director of Adelaide Writers Week. Currently, she's the program director of Dark and Dangerous Thoughts for Dark Mofo in Tasmania, their winter, winter arts festival. And maybe more relevantly, uh, she's the program curator of In Other Words for the Ausasia Festival, which is coming up uh, late October, early November. And remember, if you're a creative and you'd like to be on the show, head to Facebook and Instagram, search One Hour with Reagan, R-A-E-G-A-N. Drop me a line, let me know what you're doing, and I'd love to connect with you. So ready? Okay.
would set out on my way to a place where one could not feel down and broke. The birds in the trees all softly serenade. Well, I don't have to think about things I don't fret at all. Can remember now what made me curse and frown. And you can't feel blue. Sunshine and down. You can't feel down beneath a clear sky. Clear sky.